After seven years of fighting that have left hundreds of thousands dead and millions displaced, the devastating conflict in Syria appears to be moving toward a decisive battle. Russian and Syrian warplanes have been bombarding the outskirts of Idlib in northwestern Syria, the last remaining rebel stronghold. Over three million people are trapped in the city. This week, the United Nations warned of an impending humanitarian catastrophe, with thousands of casualties and the risk of mass flight by those who can get out. Germany and other Western countries are considering retaliatory action should Syria's military resort to poison gas during an offensive. Is Idlib the so-called endgame in Syria? And what happens after the end? Those are the questions we want to address in Quadriga, and these are our guests. Maisum Melem is of Syrian origin, and she works on DW's Arabic uh, show. She believes the battle for Idlib could be the end game for rebels in Syria, but its legacy could start a new hard time for both Turkey and Europe. And we're very glad to have Alan Posner on the program once again. He's a commentator for the daily newspaper Die Welt. And he says Germany should join the Allied military coalition to prevent a massacre by the Syrians, Russians, and Iranians in Idlib. Better late than never. And finally, it's also a pleasure to have Michel Luders uh, back with us uh, once again. He's a Middle Eastern expert and author of several books about the region. He says Assad will stay in power, but the next conflicts within Syria are already looming. So let me start out uh, by asking all of you to talk a little bit about the current situation in Syria and in particular in Idlib. And my son, uh, to you, first of all, what are you hearing from family, friends, acquaintances in Syria, uh, both about what they're expecting to happen and about the situation in Idlib in particular? Well, I've, uh, first of all, I come from a place in Syria which hasn't witnessed uh, the war, actually, because I come from Latakia, and Latakia was saved during this last seven years. Uh, but, you know, I can tell you that most of people in Syria are tired from the war, so they, um, the Syrian regime or maybe the war uh, managed to, to let them reach a point way, where they only think about their own survival. So the, they are really sad about what is going to happen in Idlib, but they don't think much about, the, about it because they are so consumed about their daily struggle to survive under a very bad economic situation, even in the safe places of Syria. And um, maybe because they say they see no way out out of this uh, situation they are living in. Michel Lides, let me ask you about a, a potential way out. The air attacks have actually let up some in the last couple of days. And this follows appeals by everybody from the UN Secretary General to Turkish President Erdogan for Russia and Syria not to press ahead with an offensive. Is it possible that those appeals have been heard? Could a full-out assault still be avoided? It's very difficult to say. In theory, yes. The Russians have made it clear that they want to eliminate all of these jihadi fighters in the region of Idlib. So there's a strong likelihood that they will go for military action. But at the same time, they are, of course, also worried that their uh, image is getting tarned and they will try probably to pursue a salami tactics, if I may say so. So go step by step and then see what's going uh, to happen. The conflict in Syria is very complex because we do not only have a civil war that has been going on over the past years we also have a proxy war that is taking place there in Syria and uh, that makes it so difficult for this war to end and I am very much afraid that the suffering of the Syrians uh, will not come to an end in the very near future. I want to talk about that proxy situation a little bit more uh, shortly but um Alan Posner, we heard uh, from my son how weary people in Syria are of this conflict. Certainly that is true for those who are witnessing it from afar. We've seen bloodshed and Western inaction for seven years now. Why should Idlib be any different? Why does the battle for Idlib matter and why should the West care at this point? Well, actually, we haven't seen Western inaction. We destroyed ISIS in Syria, um, which the Russians and the, and the Syrian government, who claimed to be doing fighting terrorists, didn't. What they did was um, besiege different cities, then let uh, 
the, East, the jihadi fighters go to Idlib. Now they've created a situation where there are 80,000 fighters, among them 10,000 radical jihadists in, in, in Idlib, a killing box, right? And, um, and, and they want to just eliminate them all. Uh, and, that, and, that, and I think that's because that's the, that is their end game, the creation of this killing box. That's why we need to, to do something. We need to stop it. You, you say, yes, and your statement, uh, your opening statement said we need to intervene, the West needs to intervene to prevent casualties. But in fact, the Western in, in interventions that you've talked about were aimed at IS or at yes. most at retaliation after chemical weapons attacks. Yes. We haven't really intervened to prevent casualties yet. Uh, you're right, and and w well, we prevented, I think, uh, uh, genocide um, of of the Yazidi population, for instance. That was very definitely one of the things that the Americans, British, French, uh, uh, and their and their Iraqi uh, allies prevented, for and their Kurdish allies, sorry, prevented. Um, to say we've done nothing would be really underplaying. Uh, uh, what the West has achieved. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that we have done nothing to stop Assad. And uh, I agree with, with in the end, um, we're going to see Russia established as a major power. Uh, and we, in spite of everything we've done, in spite of the fact that we're the only people who've ever done anything against real terrorists, we the West, um, are going to be marginalized. Before we pick up, I, I see my son getting into position to address that, but let me say, let us just briefly take a closer look at the situation in Idlib itself before we pick up some of the issues uh, that uh, Alan Posner has just raised. Uh, we have a short report on the situation in the city and its region. The people of Idlib are facing an imminent military offensive, and they're preparing for the worst. Anyone who can is getting out. Those who remain are seeking shelter in makeshift bunkers. An estimated three million civilians live here, half of them displaced from elsewhere in Syria. Also digging in here are about 10,000 mostly Islamist rebels. The bombs are meant for them. Many observers are afraid that poison gas may be used. You risk, of course, many deaths of civilian people, of innocent people, which would be uh, uh, terrible, a humanitarian catastrophe. Syria is in ruins. Hundreds of thousands are dead and millions on the run. When the offensive starts, as many as half a million more could flee. Will Idlib repeat Aleppo's fate? As soon as we just heard there, the rebels make up a disproportionately small share of the population uh, of this area at the moment. Why is the government so determined, in its own words, to liberate Idlib? We're talking about over 3 million civilians, 10,000 rebels. I mean, was it dif different than this in other places and cities in Syria, like Daraya and Douma and East Aleppo and Homs and, and many other places where the regime insisted on... Um, evacuating almost everyone who doesn't want to cooperate with uh, with them uh, and send them to Idlib. It's I think this 10,000 um, rebels in Idlib are very useful and very useful and very uh, um, convenient for the regime to retake uh, the place, the, the region, the province of Idlib again because it's the last uh, stronghold of the opposition and uh, of anyone who was saying no to this regime. I don't think it's uh, the number of the extremist Islamists which is bad enough, but um, it's um, the Syrian regime and uh, Russia behind it who has the plan from the very beginning, from the first hand, of retaking every single piece of Syria which they don't have the full control on. Michel Ludis, before the shelling began, the Syrian government said that it wants to avoid civilian casualties. We heard the UN warning in that report uh, of a potential bloodbath. Can and how can civilian casualties still be avoided?
Well, it's very difficult to say. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And uh, I think the civilians are going to pay a very high price. That is uh, without the question. I mean, we have seen it in other areas of conflict in Syria uh, as well. The regime is very brutal in defending its, its power. It makes no compromises whatsoever. The era in the Western conception, in my view, when it comes to the warring parties in Syria, is simply that they believe that they are good guys who are waging the war in a more humane uh, way, who are going and willing to establish a new Syria area, which is uh, not really in the making for the time being. And this is different reasons. We do not only have the uh, situation in Syria itself that we have to, to look at. We also have to, to note that Syria is in the middle of a geostrategical struggle between different actors. And it is very, very important to understand this. It is the Western countries, especially the United States, but also the European Union, plus uh, Turkey and the Gulf Arab states, that decided to topple the regime of Bashar al-Assad when the revolt in Syria started in 2011, not because he is a brutal dictator, which of course he is, but because they wanted to install a regime that is pro-Western rather than pro-Russian. However, both the Russians, the Iranians and the Chinese were not willing to have the West uh, succeed in Syria. And uh, in the end, they were more unscrupulous, smarter in understanding the setup of the Syrian conflict, and they managed to, for the regime to regain control of most of the country. Okay, I want to pick up on that in a moment, but bringing it back to Idlib itself, what would you expect from the rebels themselves? Would you expect them to use the civilians essentially as hostages and shields? The jihadi rebels, undoubtedly, they will do so. They have been doing so in the past weeks already. They do not care about civilian casualties. They are no different in their mentality from those holding power in Damascus. And it was a strong error of Western countries to support these people, believing that they could bring about change in Syria. These jihadi fighters, where, they, where do they come from? I mean, it's, it's quite amazing to see that most of these jihadi fighters are close to al-Qaeda. Nevertheless, these fighters have been supported in the past by the Gulf Arab states by Turkey and also by the Western countries who let Turkey and uh, the uh, Gulf Arab states do whatever they pleased. They were, if I may say so, useful idiots who now are, of course, a problem for everybody because the Turks, Turkey, is not willing to accept these people as refugees. If these 10,000 people left Idlib, there would be no need for a struggle for Idlib from the point of view of the regime. But the Turks, of course, are not willing to take these people in because it would mean creating a domestic problem for Turkey itself. And indeed, uh, Alan Posner, Turkey has now closed its border to, uh, to northern Syria, in other words, uh, to Idlib. What do you see as the potential implications of an all-out offensive in Idlib uh, in terms of the kind of regional uh, politics that Michel Ludas is talking about, but also in terms, of course, of refugee flows? Uh, well, um just one short correction, there are 80,000 fighters, more or less, in Idlib, of whom 10,000 are the kind of jihadists you talked about, but 70,000 are people who took up arms because the regime oppressed them and not because the West used them as, as idiots, as you say, uh, useful idiots against uh, Assad. So I think we need to... Uh, and, and these are the people we should be worried about. These are people who took up arms after they'd been oppressed, um, who in other, you know, who we would call resistance fighters, if, if, it, if it were in France or somewhere like that, uh, you know, who, who are in a, in a noble tradition of fighting a, a, a fascist regime, and we owe them, right? Uh, but... Um, how to separate them now from the jihadists because it's been Assad's policy to mix them up all up together in Idlib. I, I, honestly, I, I don't know. Quite frankly, I don't know. Um, uh, but there, there has to be some way of separating uh, those whom we owe to those whom we have been fighting in the rest of Syria. Um, it's simply not true that we've been using al-Qaeda and so on against... Uh, against Assad. We've been fighting the real terrorists all along. We fought them in Raqqa, we fought them uh, in, the, in the Jaziri districts, we fought them all the way to the, to, to the, to the environs of, ba uh, of Baghdad, uh, where, they, where, where the Russians and the Syrians did nothing. But how to do this concretely, I, I really don't know. But, but it has to be a concerted effort, which is why I feel we can't, 
stand aside. We need to talk to the Turks. We need to talk to the Americans. We need to talk to the British and French and develop a strategy there. We'll talk in just a minute about what that might look like. But just now, focusing on Turkey, uh, if you would, mm -hmm. uh, Maisun, you predicted in your opening statement hard times for both Turkey and the West. And Turkey has been warning very anxiously of mm -hmm. a flow of refugees that would dwarf anything we've seen so far in the Syrian war, should the all-out battle for Idlib mm -hmm. begin. Uh, do you think that's right? Well, not only Turkey, also the UN warned of uh, 700 million refugees leaving the country if the attack really starts, and it is 700, starting. 700,000. Sorry. Um, yes, and Turkey is passing through the worst economical crisis since 2002, I think. So it's really, uh, without the will of defending Turkey or anyone, it's not able to take in any refugee more in Turkey. There might be a chance to relocate some of these refugees to the north of Syria, where uh, Euphrates Shields, the, um, the Free Syrian Army, which is uh, supported by Turkey, uh, which, they, uh, which is controlling, um, there, there would be a chance to relo relocate these um, refugees to this place in Syria, but it's not a solution. I think the West should um, stay in dialogue with Turkey because of its own interest, because the, the, tragedy, the, strategy, uh, the tragedy, sorry, the catastrophe is on the way. I'm afraid we're not, a, we're not able to do anything to stop it, but uh, if we are thinking about our own interest here in Europe, we should talk about, about it with Turkey and see how we could do um, the less worst scenario out of it. So let's talk to Erdogan. He's coming to Germany um, in a couple of days and see what they want to let things, let things be not so bad as they are going to be. Meanwhile, of course, Western countries are talking with one another about whether and how to intervene in Syria uh, if Syria and Russia should move ahead with an offensive. The if uh, is whether chemical weapons are used. Even Germany, which has been traditionally reluctant to commit forces out of area, is now in talks with the U.S. and other allies about whether it would participate in military action in the event of the use of chemical weapons. Let's hear Angela Merkel on the subject. Simply to maintain that we can look the other way if chemical weapons are used somewhere in violation of an international convention cannot be our response either. All our responses will always be based on the German constitution and parliamentary obligations. That's absolutely clear. It cannot be the German position to simply say no, no matter what happens in the world. Michel Ludos, what purpose would be served by joint Western action in the case, in case of a threat of the use of chemical weapons? Has it uh, achieved results in the past? And would German participation make sense? No, it wouldn't make sense, but we need to understand the reasoning behind this discussion, which is, of course, a theoretical discussion, because so far the regime has not used chemical weapons. I mean, of course, the regime is willing to do anything to defend its power. We've seen that in the past, and they might use it. But on the other hand, in East Ruta in April, it was also claimed that the Syrians, that the regime had used chemical weapons, and until this very day, we have no proof whatsoever. Why? is this discussion so important? The basic issue of this, in my view, is that the West, mainly the United States in this context, is not willing to concede, if I may say so, defeat to the Russian side. Let's be very frank. When it comes to the survival of the regime of Bashar al-Assad, regardless of what is going to happen in Idlib in the next weeks or days, the regime will stay in power, and Russia, Iran, and China are the winners in this geopolitical monopoly, if you wish, against the West, and neither a, a political force in the United States, nor in Europe, is really willing to concede defeat. And therefore, we need to find new solutions in order to weaken the Russians and especially the Iranians, because that's the next round of violence that we are going to see. We have already seen it, although it's not very much commented and reported on in Western media. There's already a proxy war, another one going on in Syria between Israel and Iran, and this proxy war is going to heat up in the next weeks, and we are going to see more problems uh, of okay. this nature. Yeah. Let's first of all stay with the question of Western intervention. Alan, you advocated it in your opening statement, but do you really believe that past actions to retaliate for the use of chemical weapons have achieved anything? No.
I don't believe it at all. Um, what, what I advocated time and time again, and it wasn't my idea, was, to, was a no-fly zone in northern uh, Syria, which would allow civilians, uh, refugees, but also fighters, to, civilians to be resettled and fighters to regroup. Um, and uh, this is what Turkey demanded all the time. Complete, I mean, Erdogan was let down time and time again by his so-called allies, by us. Um, so, so, no, I don't think that... Uh, uh, that it will uh, really help. But I do agree with Mr. Ludas that um, we, and you saw this with Merkel, with the way I've seldom seen her like this all the time, we don't want to concede total defeat. And I think that's a perfectly natural and, and correct uh, reaction. It's too late, really, but it's better late than never. Is it, though? I mean, isn't that just purely symbolic, then, Meissen and Melham? Yes. And isn't there a level of hypocrisy here that we talk about intervening if there are chemical weapons, we are already the U.S.-backed fighters in Syria are right now pursuing their own end game against IS. So we get into the action against IS. We get into the action when chemical weapons are involved, but we don't do anything when barrel bombs fall, when conventional weapons kill thousands and thousands of civilians. So would symbolic Western action here make any difference? It's a difference? pure hypocrisy, as you say. It's a pure hypocrisy. And, uh, I mean, Bashar al-Assad and his uh, allies killed much more people using bombs than the two or three times which we suspected of uh, him having or having used uh, chemical weapons. I think it's the point is more about claiming more power for Germany. And Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen, a Germany um, defense minister, said it in April this year, we are now uh, trying to obtain a permanent uh, seat in the Security Council in the UN. And uh, this put us in front of new jobs uh, on the international level, and which means we, are, we might be able to join any military action in Syria. She said it, like, very frankly. Uh, at the beginning of this year. It's more about our interests here in Germany and in Europe Absolutely. and about claiming power. Michel Ludes, do you think that the German government would even be able to persuade its junior coalition partner, the Social Democrats, and the German people to go along? Polls this week showed 74% of Germans oppose any German involvement in this conflict. Absolutely. That's a very important number that you quote there. It's 74-75%. Uh, uh, that means most Germans are against it, and they seem to have the right uh, instinct because a military intervention in Syria would be dangerous. We have seen this in April when there was a, a supposed chemical attack that was linked to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Maybe he was in charge, maybe he was not responsible. We simply do not know. We haven't had any evidence to this very day. But nevertheless, the Americans started to bomb Syria in retaliation for this. And it was very, very dangerous, especially due to the tweeting, tweeted messages of Donald Trump when he, when he uh, challenged the Russians, saying our, our weapons will come smart and uh, they will destroy what we want to destroy. The Russians made it very clear there's a red line and if you cross this red line it's going to become dangerous so there is a potential that this conflict in Syria which is bad enough uh, it will lead to an escalation between the United States and and Russia because the Russians will adhere to this regime the reason this is a very important point that you mentioned the no-fly zone that is of course a good argument but the Russians would never have accepted this neither the Chinese and you know why because they accepted this in the case of Libya and the result of this was that Gaddafi was toppled. So from that moment on, moment on, when the Russians and Chinese, whether we like their policies or not, when they understood how the West plays its game, they said not one inch of uh, conceding anything to the West and the Syrians paid the price. But at that time, Europe wasn't threatened by a new refugee wave. We are talking about a new era now, a new yes. time. And Erdogan is obviously threatening and he's going to do what he threatened of. We ask in our title whether Idlib could be endgame, and we also ask, and what happens afterwards? So I'd like to make a brief cut and go to that question. We have very little time remaining on the clock. Uh, Alan Posner, the UN envoy for the Middle East, for Syria, is now trying a last-ditch uh, effort uh, at peace talks. Uh, what leverage does the West have? What, if anything, could it still do? The U.S. Uh, ambassador to the U.N. is playing the money card. Could that make a difference? No. Um, the, only, the only money that counts, the only currency that counts in Syria, as in most of uh, the Middle East, um, is power. 
and military power at that. That's the only thing that counts, as we've seen in Syria. Uh, and so we have to get engaged. Um, it's a very dangerous game, I agree. But we, you know, if you're a big power like Germany, if you're the West, if so much is at stake, you have to take the risk. And I think we, the first thing we need to do is to state clearly that we will react to any chemical attacks, and then we take the game from there. But I think we sh if, we, if, we, if we simply draw, say, the, as Merkel said, simply standing by and doing nothing. In the end, we'll have the refugees, we'll have um, the three powers you mentioned uh, in charge of Syria, and the next thing will be Lebanon. They'll be retaking Lebanon, which the Syrians have never wanted to give up. Uh, they've already got, I mean, they're basically half in power there anyway. So, no, it won't end there. It's, that's the point. It won't end there. My son, you made a similar point uh, in your opening statement uh, that the end game essentially would be the beginning of something new. Optimists say the end game could usher in a phase of rebuilding, allowing refugees finally to return to Syria. Do you think that really is in the no, offing? We're far away from rebuilding anything in Syria. The conflict is still going on and it's just shifting to another place in the world. Thanks to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. See you soon.